Hey everybody, it's kind of been a while since my last video, but uh, um, just been busy with all the COVID and all the other stuff going on, so I was able to finally, after a while, get this thing done and uploaded. So, um, without much further ado, let's get started. So, today we're just going to talk about what is APRV or bi level or bi vent. Uh, it just all depends on whatever your ventilator manufacturer's company has dubbed it, but the technical is APRV, um, why we're using it, settings, how to manage it, and then some of the limits of APRV. So just a quick recap of everything. Um, these are just a copy of slides from my uh, ventilator lecture video I did before, so um, if you need to, you can go back to that, um, the mechanical ventilation, uh, non-invasive and invasive, to uh, get reacquainted with uh, what's going on here. So just, you know, what are we trying to be in control of, you know, all that stuff. Um, volume control versus pressure control, that's what the waveform looks like. Uh, the difference is notice the shark fin shape in the pressure versus the flat because in pressure control that's what you're doing you're you're controlling the pressure and then just the overall shape of the flow and the volume itself just shows you just the differences in how um, things are presented and then you know assist control you're setting a minimum rate volume insp volume or inspiratory pressure um, or delta p or P insp, um, like I said, it just depends on whatever your vent manufacturer and however they lay it out. Um, the patient is able to breathe over if they choose to, or if they're able to, you know, they're not paralyzed or heavily sedated. Um, you can set inspiratory time or inspiratory flow. In some places, it's constant or variable. Um, every breath has a set volume or set pressure. And then, you know, your peak pressures are variable if you're using volume control, and then your tidal volume varies if you're using compressor control because your tidal volume is is based on the static compliance of the lungs. Uh, and AC uh, pressure support is not available. You can peep them up if you need to, but the main consensus of this is that all breaths are the same. Um, SIMV, you know, you do set a minimum rate volume or pressure. Uh, you're allowing the patient to breathe spontaneously. Um, the volumes can vary if you're using the um, pressure uh, control versus volume control. Um, in this one, you, you can use pressure support um, and PEEP. Um, mandatory breaths are taken as a patient with patient's effort. And then it's also used as a weaning mode for longer term patients, usually trach patients. I've seen it very commonly used at my hospital in uh, a trauma IC for longer term, like TBIs or something like that that patients are trached and you're trying to get them weaned down to pressure support and then aerosol trach collar and if if they're able to uh, you know decannulation PRVC or VC plus uh, APV um, this one you're just setting the a uh, rate um, you're setting the target tidal volume you set inspiratory time and then you set a pressure limit or a pop off pressure um, FiO2 PEEP um, usually you don't set a pressure support, that's mostly an SIMV. And then the patient is given a few test breaths, two centimeters per uh, per breath to help achieve target tidal volume. But the general consensus for this one is you're helping give a target tidal volume at the lowest possible pressure. That's why the pressure itself regulates. It's, it's part of the lung protective ventilation uh, measure that um, a lot of ventilator manufacturers move to. Um, as the technology became more advanced. So pressure support ventilation or PSV, this is basically BiPAP on a ventilator. Um, you set the inspiratory pressure, the volume and flows are varied, it's all patient initiated, and then you can peep, use PEEP here. Um, but the primary purpose is to augment the flow uh, during spontaneous breaths, and then you're overcoming the resistance of having an endotracheal tube. So just remember your endotracheal, or not endotracheal, your trachea is roughly the size of a quarter. You have an eight millimeter ET tube in there, and that's a third of the airway. So, you know, Hooke's Law says you're going to have more resistance the, the smaller the radius of 
uh, the tube. And then here's, bit, here's bi-level or APRV or airway pressure release ventilation. So it's inverse ratio, which means the inspiratory time is longer than the expiratory time. It's pressure controlled. It's intermittent mandatory ventilation with unrestricted spontaneous breathing. Um, back in the 80s, they did a thing called the open lung approach to ventilation. And then uh, this first study that came out was in 87 by Stock and Company. And then you're, you, it's based on two levels of PEEP, uh, PEEP high and PEEP low. Um, and then you also have your time high and your time low. And what you're trying to do is recruit alveoli. Now the patient, if they're able to, they can breathe spontaneously during the PEEP high and PEEP low. And with the shorter um, T low, you're, uh, you're allowing for a certain degree of auto PEEP, um, which is volume or pressure left over in the lungs um, after exhalation and then you can adjust the degree of auto peep on whatever ABG is and then it, this is primarily used in most cases for patients who were undergoing ARDS and it prevents volume trauma to the lungs. Um, I've also heard of patients being put on bilevel as a post-op uh, recruitment from surgery, um, you can do a drop and stretch and then you can um, wean them down to CPAP and then extubate them from that. Uh, it just depends on you know, hospital policies, procedures, and if the doctors are comfortable using um, this method of ventilation. For most people, it is a difficult mode of ventilation to manage and you know, if you, if you can do it, it's, you're, you're definitely um, a step above some folks. So that's kind of what it looks like in a sort of nutshell. I've never seen it look that specific, but um, you're, you, you can see the little blips at the P high. Those are the spontaneous breaths, the short release, and then it's just how it goes. Um, and that's kind of similar to what it would look like on, uh, this is a here to men at 840. Um, as you can see, the little green, that's the machine breath. The little orange, that's the pressure support. And then once it's done, it goes back to the original peep high. There's your short, should be a shorter exhalation, but um, looks like your inspiratory time is about five seconds. Expiratory time about one, so uh, the rate is probably about 10. Um, but and then the second breath, it shows you know the the patient initiating it, which is giving it the total pressure support, and then it you know and that's how it looks. So the best way to do APRV, um, I got a lot of this these um, criteria from lifeinthefastlane.com. Um, and they base theirs on the stock study, and then Dr. Nader Habashi who has been one of the leading proponents of APRV. Uh, Dr. Downs and Dr. McIntyre are also very involved in the world of APRV. So um, that's where I've gotten um, my stuff from is all the stuff that these three um, doctors and then Dr. Stock's group came from. So that's where I was trained on how to do it. but. You know, there's there's more than one way to getting it done. So per Dr. Nixon in the Life in the Fast Lane website, um, you can have you want to monitor your P high. Uh, you want to try and keep it around 30 centimeters or less, and then your P low is usually zero to five centimeters. Now, obviously, you can titrate each one up and down if you need to, um, but as initially this is what you want to do so you want your time high of 4.5 to 6 seconds so that's usually a rate of you know like 10 to 12 or so uh, your T low 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.8 I've had better success with 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 um, but it just depends on if you want to allow for uh, an auto peep and then you can also um, use tube compensation uh, to allow spontaneous breathing, which is, you know, the pressure support. Um, most of the doctors I've seen that do it if the patient's not totally sedated and paralyzed. Usually it's about five centimeters of uh, pressure support. 
Uh, you also want to have a time constant, and then you want to kind of calculate that to about 63% or about two-thirds of empty lung volume. And then um, a good rule of thumb is that complete emptying requires four times the time constant. Um, but this is how where you get auto peep. So what you can do is by having a lower peep low and then auto peep on top of that, you're allowing for more of a ventilation and you can have possibly less permissive hypercapnia, but every patient's different. And then what you want to do is you take your P high minus P, it should be P low, sorry about the typo, and then that's also your delta P, and then you have your airway pressure release time, which is also your expiratory phase, or T low, and then you kind of want to keep it at one set time, and that way it ends when the flow reaches about 40%, and then you can use your, your uh, flow time curve on the ventilator if you're able to get one and just kind of titrate it from there. Um, set your rate and then you can do spontaneous breathing if you want that to be also a part of your the minute ventilation you're accounting for. But the main goal is to keep your pH above 7.2 and your PaCO2 below 60. Um, and then if you need to have make changes, you increase your P high by 2 centimeters, and then you can increase your T low by 0 0.05 seconds to allow for more exhalation, which will give you a larger tidal volume. And then you kind of slowly titrate it up until your P high is about 40 and your T low is about 0.9. And your auto peep should be pretty minimal on that, and then you can just increase your T high if you need to. And then, you know, by doing so, you increase the IDU ratio. And then get an EBG in about 30 to 60 minutes. And then, you know, if there's no improvement or the patient ends up getting worse, you know, you might want to call the physician and see what they would like to do next. So for oxygenation, 21% is always preferred. I've never seen it at 21%. I think the most I've ever seen is 30 or 35%. Um, PaO2 is greater than 70, and then SpO2 is greater than 92%. I've heard a uh, PO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury and the SpO2 of 88% are better. It, like I said, there's just it just depends on what your hospital wants to do. Um, by doing, by, and also by making this happen, you increase the mean, mean airway pressure, and it's based mostly on your time high and your pressure or your P high, and then you can also increase your P high by you know the two centimeters as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword of oxygenation and ventilation because higher pressures when they drop will give you a ventilation, but also the P high will increase your mean airway pressure as well, which is also, as we know, is your alveolar pressure, which by having higher alveolar pressure, you have more surface area for gas exchange, which in turn helps with oxygenation as well. And then you can also decrease, in this instance, your time low, which will cause you to have the auto peep. So it's kind of a very delicate balance of managing um, by level on whether you want the permissive hypercabinet or do you want the oxygenation. Now if the renal function is good, you can use the body's natural bicarb function to um, buffer that higher levels of CO2. Um, but you know you can also keep increasing your pressures until they get to 50 centimeters. I've only seen that a few times. I've actually seen it more now with the COVID-19 stuff because of how much dead space ventilation there are in some of these patients, which from the end tidal CO2 to the ABG is about 30 millimeters of mercury. So that's a significant amount of dead space. So we're trying to do what we can. Um, but you also want to get ABGs with these people every 30 to 60 minutes with each change and then keep in contact with your physician. So LWW.com is a literature website. Um, this is an algorithm I found um, on there of how they um, use um, APRV. So um, 
and I think it was I didn't pay anything for it. I just Googled it. So I mean that's a plus. So if you need to, you can go to lww.com or you can just Google um, APRV algorithms from LWW, and you know you can print it out if you need to and keep it in your respiratory notebook and see what you can do to manage by level. Um, on, you know, especially now with COVID, a lot of patients are on bi level. And so, if we can get a patient to wean down, so let's say they don't need bi level anymore. So, you know, what you want to look at is is the P low, is your P high at 16 centimeters? You know, is the T high greater than 10 seconds? So, you know, you're dropping the pressure, stretching the T high, and you're kind of getting these people down to almost like a CPAP sort of BiPAP I guess and then you kind of look at you know are they stable are they your GCS greater than 8 is the P high at 16 FAO2 30% or less you know as there are going to be no airway obstructions you know if they if you feel that these patients can meet all these criteria then yeah uh, you know you can attempt an SBT of 5 to 10 centimeters you know for 30 minutes do your weaning parameters and then either you extubate or you don't and you know you guys make it work you know some of these patients if they get exubated some people say uh, lww says use a vapotherm you know um high flow cannula um i've done high flow cannulas i've done patients exubated right to a cpap or a bipap depending on their condition um it just depends on um your physician so the best way to wean these people is to lower your P high by two to three centimeters um, at a time and then slowly lengthen your uh, time high by 0.5 to 2 seconds at a time. And then if you're at give or take 16 centimeters, T high 12 to 15 seconds, change them over to CPAP and um, do an SPT. So the advantages of using APRV um, you know, it helps with alveolar recruitment and oxygenation. Um, you also allow them to breathe spontaneously on top of what they're already doing. And you're uh, reducing the left ventricular transmural pressure and therefore uh, left ventricular afterload, um, which we know can possibly drop uh, blood pressure, um, which can be a good thing. And then you're protecting the lungs themselves, which is good because it protects the patients from going through a cytokine storm and have the inflammatory response, which is bad. And, you know, that leads to the angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and then we have to worry about other issues as well. And then you kind of lower the sedation requirements to allow for spontaneous breathing. So that means you don't have to necessarily paralyze them because they can breathe over the ventilator. Uh, sometimes a little sedation doesn't hurt because they don't always breathe most synchronous with the ventilator, but you know you're you're giving them the ability to breathe with it. Now the disadvantages of you know you you run the risk of uh, value trauma from the pulmonary increased pulmonary pressures, which you know having you know longer term 50 centimeters of pressure, yeah, that can lead to issues. Um, the work of breathing uh, with the spontaneous uh, efforts can be a negative. Um, and then also just the increased energy expenditure due to the spontaneous breathing can potentially cause a problem. And then if you have like a bronchopleural fistula or something like that, it can actually make it worse. In my opinion, if that's the case, then I wouldn't necessarily put them on by level if they have a bronchopleural uh, fistula or a tracheal esophageal fistula or anything like that. Also, you increase uh, right ventricular afterload, which can worsen pulmonary hypertension. Uh, you reduce venous return, which may cause an increase uh, in intracranial pressures um, and also can make cardiac output worse for patients who are already hypovolemic. So there are definitely considerations that you want to make before you just throw a patient on by level. And then you also run the risk of dynamic hyperinflation due to the certain degree of auto peep. Um, I guess the best way to put it is some of these patients' lungs look like they have COPD due to just the extra pressure. And then please note the, um, you know, there is no evidence to say that APRV improves 
mortality rates, but they they have seen improvement in certain physiological variables in both humans and animals. So there's evidence that it works. There's just not necessarily evidence that your mortality is going to drop because you are using it. And then um, just Dr. Habashi works at the University of Maryland Medical Center um, and then their website maryland.ccproject.com if you search APRV um, Dr. Habashi himself does have information and I think there is an online lecture from him. Um, the, the chest studied uh, from October 98 from Dr. Stock and company. Um, also Dr. Downs published an article called APRV, the human trial back in the 80s, uh, February 2012, Dowd and company. Um, you know, what do we know about APRV? The question, you know, the what we do know is that it works. We do know that we have the, um, we're doing something right, but the problem is the consensus among uh, practitioners is that we're, we're consistently inconsistent. And I did read the, the article, and at the moment I'm drawing a blank, but um, one part of the article, there's a big agreement on why we're doing one thing, and then there's a huge agreement on the how we're not all doing it the same and I want to say it's the practice um, I would have to read it again so I'm I'm sorry for not knowing that information off the top of my head um, and then October uh, 2017 in the respiratory care journal Miller and company also including Dr. McIntyre you know they um, released an article about clinical management strategies for airway uh, APRV and then they you know it's a survey clinical practice so we there are resources out there um, for APRV and then here is um, for COVID-19, here's a link, um, emcrit.org, uh, they have some fantastic um, information for ventilator management, just in general. Um, and this was, was very good for um, management of COVID-19 positive intubated patients who are on APRV. So I do recommend highly this, this article. Um, we're starting to get an uptick where I'm at of COVID positive patients who are being uh, intubated. So I'm definitely going to need a refresher course um, from that article on what I can do and recommendations that I can make to the uh, critical care team who are managing these patients that are um, difficult to manage. So um, that is a very good resource. So if there's any questions, um, feel free to email me at mediocrert at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my page. I'm also looking for any um, ideas of content people would like me to uh, do a PowerPoint on. Um, I personally feel that PowerPoints are the easiest way to learn because you can just follow the information, take notes, and, and listen. And if you need to, you can rewind and um, take more notes if need be. Um, but just... Uh, just feel free to, to hit me up. I'm always looking for more feedback. Thank you.